Hello, folks. Welcome back to English 102. Um, this is going to be a video lecture over essay number three, which, as you can see, forms <clears throat> module five. And that is due in a couple of weeks on November 8th. Um, so the outline and the instructions are the same as essays one and two and three, uh, or one and two, excuse me. So here in module five in the Canvas module, uh, these instructions are the same. <clears throat> um, again, please follow these steps closely, thoroughly, and in order. So each one of these linked steps uh, provides you information and resources to write a solid essay. And so if you, in the module, click on this first link here, the essay guide, what you'll be taken to is this essay guide that, as you can see, looks the same as essay one and two. Um, <clears throat> essay three, is over legalizing recreational cannabis. And notice that the word recreational is italicized or emphasized uh, because uh, you are not allowed to write on medical cannabis as I will explain in a moment. The due date again is Monday, November 8th. Uh, please follow this outline. It's pretty straightforward introduction paragraph on what your opposition thinks, but why they're wrong. And then your three main points in the body of the essay of why you think we should or should not legalize recreational cannabis, and then your conclusion. Um, I think a lot of you may not either be watching these videos or not actually following these steps because I, in every, essay guide, I say, follow and apply this checklist. And uh, again, if you, you know, click on this link, takes you to a document in our Google Drive. Um, this is the essay checklist. So that if you actually follow all of these steps and questions, uh, a lot of them are simple formatting issues then you will not end up losing points on your essay. So for example, as I've pointed out with some of you on your essay one and two, it becomes pretty clear that you, some of you have not followed these uh, steps or questions. And they're all related to avoiding plagiarism about, you know, does each source for my in-text citation appear alphabetically on the work cited, meaning you may have a source cited in your text, uh, whether parenthetically or in the sentence itself, but if it's not also on the work cited page, that constitutes plagiarism. And then conversely, is each source listed on my work cited page cited in the body text at least once? Meaning if you have a source listed on the work cited page, then that needs to be cited or mentioned specifically at least once, you can do it more than once, in the actual essay. And then of course, you know, is each work cited formatted completely and correctly, meaning you don't just throw in, copy and paste a web address or URL, you do it like the uh, sample paper shows you. And the sample paper is down here linked to at the bottom of the essay guide. Um, it's one that I've shown you before and you should have seen. Um, so your essay will look like this in terms of formatting. And then of course your, your works cited page will look like this in terms of your sources fully documented. And again, this is a, a reminder on, on this page, this label, works cited, means here is a list of sources listed alphabetically. So you know, in this case, Adams is first, AD comes before AM. Here's a list of sources 
documented fully that I have actually cited at least once in my essay. So we should find somewhere, because this appears on the work cited, we should find somewhere in the essay that this Adam source is cited at least once. And in fact, it is because it is cited right here in terms of this uh, image or cartoon that the student writer uses. So again, uh, follow the format and documentation style and the sample paper that's linked to at the bottom of the essay guide. If you have questions about, you know, specific MLA style, uh, you know, formatting or, you know, how do I treat a quotation, uh, then this link here to the Purdue Online Writing Lab, OWL, Purdue Online Writing Lab, uh, contains a plethora of information about, you know, how to format quotations or uh, how to uh, do a set of works cited entries, right? Free resource. It's like basically having a book online. All right. So getting back to this essay guide here, uh, again, follow this outline. You will have a solid argument when you do. And then on the second page, um, this is what's going to be different about essay number three as opposed to one and two. So on one and two, you had a topic, say, erasing racism or privacy with essay one and two, respectively. Um, <clears throat> but in this case, rather than have multiple possible topics from which you could choose, everyone is going to be writing the same topic or on the same topic. As I say here, unlike essay number one and two, all students will write on the following topic. And the topic is, should or should we not legalize recreational cannabis throughout all 50 states? And notice again, this word is italicized and underlined um, because as I point out here, that uh, most states in the United States currently have some form of medical uh, cannabis use, whether it's, you know, for insomnia, glaucoma, epilepsy, uh, a wide range of medical issues, um, then medical marijuana becomes less of a controversy and issue to argue than recreational cannabis. Recreational meaning, of course, uh, just for the sheer pleasure of it. So on this page two of the guide, what I've done is list some common pros and cons of legalizing recreational cannabis. Uh, in green here, you know, the green supporting the pro side or the for side, and the red, like a stop sign, uh, the con or negative side. And these are just not all, but there's some, and I'll kind of walk through a few of these with you. Uh, speaking of pros and cons, I say down below here, uh, warning, do not use and or rely upon information in the cannabis or marijuana sections of the procon.org website. The sources they use are not reliable and are verifiable. If you do use this website in your essay number three, your essay will lose many points. So I'm warning you now, folks, if you cite and or document sources from this procon.org website about recreational cannabis, you will lose points because, again, they're not reliable. What you need to do is either use the sources that are currently in our, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, Google Drive folder or find other reliable sources. Um, and I even give you this link here um, called uh, NORMAL or stands for the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Uh, a bit of a pun on normal, that is to make it normal. Uh, and pretty much every state of the union, there is a chapter or multiple chapters of this organization. Now, I have a note here that 
uh, in the past, Grambling used to block this site because they didn't want students finding out about marijuana or cannabis, which is a bit uh, ironic because it's, uh, again, a, an increasingly national issue. But after all, it is a state university and in Louisiana, it is still illegal. Uh, speaking of which, if you click on this link here, um, it will take you to the normal site. And if you cannot access it on Grambling's campus, then try to access it from a source that's not connected to Grambling or the Wi-Fi or on your own. Um, but on this website, there's a lot of very valuable information and it's updated. Uh, and legitimate because they're actually uh, like a lobby group for Congress. Um, so here, if you click on state laws, as I just mentioned, uh, you know, in terms of uh, Louisiana. So uh, state laws, you can just, you know, in this interactive map, just click on a particular state, right? Like in this case, Grambling is in Louisiana. So you click on this and it will take you to what the state laws are. So for example, uh, 14 grams or less is a misdemeanor in Louisiana, okay? And you could receive a fine up to $100. More than 14 grams, and less than two and a half pounds, if it's your first time. It's still a misdemeanor, but notice it's an automatic six months in jail time. Um, this is what we call mandatory sentencing. And it's part of the argument of why we perhaps should not, uh, you know, maintain that it's illegal, that is, uh, Mandatory sentencing, of course, is incredibly expensive for states. And then, of course, if you uh, have in your possession and or selling um, of two and a half pounds or, or more, uh, it's an automatic felony with uh, some serious jail time. Um, if you're found out in Louisiana to be selling any amount, right, that is distribution or cultivation, growing, distribution, selling. Uh, any amount is an automatic felony, minimum of five years, if you are found out to be selling. So again, uh, like it says here, the, the asterisk there with the five refers to this mandatory sentencing. So if you live in a different state, and go back to this interactive map, let's take I don't know, somewhere like uh, California or Colorado that has already uh, legalized recreational cannabis. And you can see that you can have much more than 14 grams. You can have up to an ounce, which I think is uh, 20 something grams or more. Uh, there's no penalty, right? That it's, you can have it for your own personal use. Uh, if you have more than that, then it's a misdemeanor, but instead of half a year in jail, there's only 10, 10 days, right? Um, <clears throat> if uh, you're involved in a sale or delivery, distribution, right? Uh, any amount is a misdemeanor, not a felony, as it is in Louisiana. Uh, and rather than a minimum of five years, it's six months, right? So. Um, what I'm trying to point out here is that this map is showing you that we have a very fractured patchwork system in the United States of laws relating to cannabis. And that's because, of course, um, right now, anyway, uh, Congress has not passed a federal national law against uh, the illegality of it, or that is to, to make it legal. Um, so, uh, one of the things that I, I point out, uh, here is that, uh, right. And the question is, should we legalize recreational cannabis again, not medical 
throughout all 50 states. Um, because if we did, then we would have, as some people would argue, uh, more money for taxation, uh, a lower incarceration rate, especially because of mandatory sentencing, a reduction of organized crime, meaning if you uh, make a substance illegal, then, you know, whether it's heroin or opioids or whatever, uh, then you create an underground or black market, right? Uh, which often organized crime is involved in. So if you make something like, let's say theoretically, we'll go back to prohibition for that matter, alcohol uh, or cigarettes, if you make those illegal, then there are gonna be people still producing it under the radar or underground, if you will, but it's going to be uh, unregulated. Uh, there's gonna be a high chance of uh, the product not being uh, you know, really good for you. Not that necessarily smoking is good for you as I'll point out in a minute, um, but at least if it is legalized, you can like cigarettes and alcohol, you can regulate it in terms of uh, you know, the government being able to oversee its production, distribution. Uh, and if you're buying something, let's say hypothetically in Louisiana, where it's illegal, uh, then you don't necessarily know what you're getting. But if you're in California, Colorado, Washington state and so on, places that have legalized recreational cannabis, then there are legitimate cultivators, growers that produce pretty high quality, untainted cannabis. Uh, it will produce jobs, meaning uh, you'll have all kinds of, uh, again, cultivators, uh, distributors, uh, vendors like, you know, cannabis shops and so on. And not to mention, you know, uh, you know, edibles like gummies or whatever, all of those, uh, are creating jobs, right? Um, and there will be a decrease in racial prison sentencing. And that's of course connected to number two. Uh, in other words, number five here is a little more specific, but as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, all too often it's people of color who are caught possessing and they're selling cannabis in states where it's illegal or amounts where it's illegal and they're incarcerated. Um, and this of course is, you know, tying back to essay number one about erasing racism, that if you're living in areas of poverty, then turning to drug sales might make sense. Um, some people may argue that it's less harmful than hardcore narcotics. Um, that is, you know, if there's gonna be a drug that you use, um, you know, marijuana is by far safer than, you know, heroin or cocaine or uh, methamphetamine or, you know, those kind of hard drugs. Um, however, uh, this word right here, narcotics, I'm going to show you, the federal government still views marijuana or classifies cannabis as a schedule one drug. Um, so there's a whole list of <clears throat> drugs by the United States that is considered, uh, you know, high potential for abuse, um, no current except the medical use, which is a bit of an irony because many states have already, you know, found out that uh, cannabis and, you know, particularly CBD form has medical uh, efficacy, um, or that there's a lack of safety, right? These are all reasons. So if you look at this list of drugs that the uh, DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration includes, it of course includes opioids, but uh, under um, hallucinogens, right? You will see that, uh, let me just find it here. Well, over here you can see this image um, that uh, 
at uh, marijuana right here, number 7360 marijuana, uh, or even its extracts like CBD, they're still listed on this long list of hallucinogenic or psychedelic substances under the Schedule I classification of drugs in the US. Therefore, uh, you know, by definition, as a nation, as 50 federal states, uh, marijuana is still considered by the federal government illegal. Um, so that's what I was referring to. Uh, it's less than hardcore narcotics, meaning according to the government, it's still a narcotic, but it's less hardcore than say, you know, heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine. Another argument that we should legalize is that similar substances like cigarettes and alcohol are already legalized and regulated. Regulated meaning, of course, you know, uh, you have to be a certain age, you can only buy them in certain places. Um, the entire process of production and distribution and sale is controlled by the government, which of course taxes the heck out of it, and therefore, you know, makes money because uh, one of the reasons beer, alcohol, wine, um, and cigarettes, of course, are, you know, increasingly expensive is because the government and states and even counties and parishes tax people who consume those. Um, and a final reason to legalize is that uh, citizens of states can pass their own laws. Uh, so right now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a patchwork of, you know, different uh, states that have in fact created their own acceptable use of cannabis. So um, Washington State, Oregon, California, Nevada, Colorado, uh, uh, geez, all these others. Uh, let me find a, a better color-coded map. Um, so this is what I was referring to in terms of like a patchwork. So notice that currently in the gray area, uh, that is cannabis is illegal. Uh, and there are places in the South mostly, and in the breadbasket of the US that is still illegal, but a, uh, state like say Iowa here in the middle is it's illegal, but then uh, it's decriminalized. So decriminalized is not the same as illegal. It means that um, if you are caught consuming or selling to a certain amount, uh, you're not gonna automatically face a felony charge. Uh, so you see here, Louisiana, right, uh, has, D for decriminalized, um, but it also has a provision for medical use. Uh, in this case, in Louisiana, it's uh, for a particular kind of uh, epilepsy. Um, so what I mean by this is that you can see that many states throughout the union in blue here uh, have created their own laws because that's the federal system at work uh, where uh, we have what are called states' rights, but <clears throat> they're all laws throughout the United States that apply to all 50 states. So for example, I mean, you can think of many, uh, you know, child pornography is one, but even more quotidian or mundane common laws are like, you can't drive a car legally without a driver's license. You can't own a car without car insurance. You can't drive a car without being buckled up in all 50 states, right? So we can make those laws in all 50 states, but apparently Congress is unwilling to pass a law that applies to all 50 states in terms of recreational cannabis. So 
um, those who would be arguing, yes, we should legalize like these blue states here, recreational cannabis, you would be arguing that you want to entirely make all these states blue in terms of legal recreational cannabis. If you're arguing that we should not, the opposite side, make legal recreational cannabis, then you would want like all these states to turn gray in this map to go back to uh, a time when it's considered illegal. Um, so uh, those are the, the main reasons for legalizing. The main reasons for not legalizing are people want to argue that it's a medical hazard. And let's be honest, folks, the primary way that cannabis is consumed is through smoking, uh, whether it's, you know, vaping oil or an actual, you know, pipe or bong or uh, you know, blunt or cigarette. Um, we just have to automatically agree that any kind of smoke, whether it's from pollution or cigarettes, or in this case, cannabis, is hazardous to human lungs, right? So you, you can't get around that argument. That is to say, those who want to argue on this side, on the legalized side, you, you're going to have to admit and concede that yes, if we're talking about smoking inhalation, then it a medical hazard. People want to argue that it goes beyond that though. So uh, in your, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, the Google Drive of our folder. So go back up to the syllabus. Uh, do I have it in here? I don't think so, but it's in the module. So if you go to module five here, uh, Number two says, use any of these files as sources for your essay. If you click this link, these files, uh, it takes you to the drive of our folder for, uh, for, as you can see, essay three and legalization. Right now, this is in the, the list view, like a folder in a directory of a computer, uh, but you can change it to the grid view by toggling this switch up here. And all of these uh, mostly uh, articles, because uh, there's, there's the essay guide inside of it there. Um, all of these articles are fair game for you to use as sources in arguing for or against in your paper. Um, so I have some up here, uh, like if you were going to say, okay, there's you know, medical hazards, why we should not, or vice versa, if you're arguing that we should legalize cannabis. In paragraph two, you're going to need to address here those who disagree with you. And one of the reasons commonly that people disagree with legalizing is that uh, it causes medical problems, right? So you would need to provide an example or two of that. So in your folder there of the uh, Google Drive, I have some sources like that. So here is a uh, right here, a medical doctor. She's actually a pediatrician. And uh, even though this is a bit dated, 2009, as you can see, um, a lot of the arguments that she presents in this article uh, still remain. So some of the things that she argues uh, that, uh, let's see, scientific research from the National Institute on Drug Abuse and elsewhere leaves little doubt that marijuana abuse is bad for brains, particularly younger ones. So a couple of things about her rhetoric, and again, we're kind of studying rhetoric and the power and effectiveness of speech and language. Um, well, sure, any kind of abuse of any substance is going to be bad. So notice she didn't say, leaves a little doubt that marijuana use is bad. She says abuse. So it's a bit of a foregone conclusion, logically, rhetorically, for her to say 
that abuse is bad because that's what abuse means. It's something that's negative and bad. Um, and so remember, she's a pediatrician, so she tries to give evidence here, though she doesn't back it up with sources. Uh, so we're just supposed to take her word for it that, uh, for example, once THC, the active ingredient in cannabis, has delivered its buzz, it hangs around for days, if not many weeks, accumulating with regular use. Okay, so there's a, a buildup effect, if you will, in the body, just as there is with alcohol and, and nicotine. Um, she goes on to provide more medical evidence. Um, Heavy marijuana users starting early in their teens, so what we might call chronic users. Uh, and, and her point here as a pediatrician is that, you know, uh, young people's bodies and brains are still growing up till about the age of 25. So if people starting at 12 or 13 through adolescence and young adulthood are chronically, constantly using cannabis, then uh, she says, you know, MRI scans showed disrupted neural development in the brain areas that influence memory, attention, and high level decision making, areas known to develop and mature during adolescence. So, again, if you could take that information and do one of two things with it, you could say, well, if I'm arguing that we should legalize cannabis, one of my opponents arguments is that it affects people's brains in adolescence, right? You could counter that by saying, well, yes, I agree. Just like I agree that, you know, smoking causes lung cancer, we know, and therefore we have regulated it as a nation to where you have to be a certain age, typically an adult, 18 or 21, to buy nicotine. Uh, and the same is true of, of alcohol. We know it can cause uh, liver cancer, cirrhosis of the liver, and other medical problems. So we've also restricted that by age. So you could refute or, you know, that's the, the word refute or reject that argument about uh, Healy saying, well, it causes all these problems during adolescence. And you're like, well, well yeah, I... I can, I agree with that. However, I'm not arguing that adolescents should have uh, access to cannabis. Um, she also uh, says, you know, academic stars are rarely potheads. Uh, this is a, uh, a swipe at, you know, kids, children, adolescents, you know, anyone 17 or younger using cannabis, even if it's in a state like California, Washington, Nevada, where it's already legal recreationally, recreationally she's saying that, you know, uh, this stunts mental development, right, in terms of academic achievement. Um, and I just wanted to point out the, the language she's using here that doesn't endear her uh, auto, automatically or uh, in a good way with her audience whom she's trying to convince. Uh, otherwise you're preaching to the choir, so to speak. So when you use a term like potheads, rather than say users, consumers, um, that's a really negative connotation as is cannabis junkies, right? I mean, you know, we typically refer to junkies as someone who's strung out on heroin uh, and or meth or cocaine. Um, she goes on to point out that uh, uh, when pregnant women smoke the drug into the fetus, that's sort of a no brainer. I mean, if you don't understand how biology works, uh, of course it is. If nursing mothers or in nursing mothers, it enters breast milk, again, that's a no brainer. Uh, and in the cannabis receptin laden testicles, there, are, there is growing evidence. Notice it's not increasing evidence uh, or data, but it's not a, you know, close and shut case. In other words, uh, the jury's out, so to speak, about this evidence, but there's growing evidence from the laboratory 
and in humans that THC causes mutant sperm, which among other things can't swim right, thus impairing male fertility, at least while the male and his sperm are under the influence. So these are all really graphic negative kind of descriptions of what use of marijuana, especially chronic, often, you know, frequent use and abuse could cause in especially younger people. Okay, agreed, right? You could throw this bit of information in your argument to say this is one reason why we should not legalize. Again, you know, uh, over here under, uh, under medical hazards, right? <clears throat> but then you could, again, refute that if you wanted to argue for legalization that, uh, you know, she's here really, again, focusing on, uh, say, teen pregnancy or, you know, uh, underage sexual intercourse that leads to teen pregnancy. Uh, but you're not, necessarily condoning that and you're not arguing that if you're arguing for recreational cannabis in all 50 states where you have to be an adult you know 21 or older to buy it <laughs> so uh, another argument is that um, it can be addictive um, well the jury is also still out on that and this asterisk here uh, <clears throat> refers to this sort of footnote if you will down here so for something to be addictive, according to the medical community and the DSM-5, that is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Psychology and Psychiatrists, um, it has to include all three of these categories, not just one or two. So is the behavior, whether it's gambling or drinking or smoking marijuana, is it repetitive? Well, yes, it can be. Right. If you do it, you know, once a day, once a week, you know, every month, that's a kind of repetitive behavior, just as biting your nails is. Um, is it pleasure seeking? Well, I would venture to argue that probably all substances, whether heroin, uh, opioid, cocaine, alcohol, nicotine, cannabis, that there's a reason why people use it, right? And again, we are not talking about medical use, we're talking about recreational use for the fun of it, right? So inherently, yes, there's pleasure seeking in recreational cannabis. But is it also, remember it has to have all three ingredients, is it also damaging? And, you know, Bernadine Healy a moment ago under medical hazards of saying, yes, it is for these reasons. But if uh, an adult in California, Nevada, Colorado, wherever it's currently legal, consumes cannabis, say, only on the weekends, only on, say, Saturday night, you know, that's, what, 52 times a year, perhaps, uh, is it damaging to his or her health and or lifestyle? So take, for example, drinking. If you drink frequently, we know that it can lead to all kinds of ailments. That's that's a fact, as, as does nicotine smoking. Um, and if you're a gambler, for example, right, uh, it's repetitive, people get a sort of high off of it in terms of, you know, winning, whether it's the lotto or, you know, actually going to a casino. Uh, but if that behavior is done often enough, and you're mortgaging your car, your house, pawning your possessions, then, then yeah, that can actually be damaging to your lifestyle and your health overall. Uh, but is cannabis recreationally damaging? Well, again, I think the jury's out on that. Uh, another argument against legalizing is that will corrupt innocent use, which is kind of what Bernadine Healy was pointing out there. Um, so the argument here is that like say cigarettes and alcohol that are already regulated and legal, um, that if it is around, so to speak, like let's say, you know, little Joey has an uncle who, you know, uses recreational cannabis in California. And when little Joey happens to visit, he discovers 
you know, on the coffee table or in the bedroom or something, like there's some weed there, right? And therefore the child will uh, be, you know, around it and have it available and therefore be tempted in, to try to use it, right? Um, and so we want to, you know, keep youth, which I think, again, you know, most people would rationally argue, well, yes, keep youth away from it. But if you're going to argue this, we should, you know, not legalize recreational cannabis because it's going to corrupt innocent youth because they're going to be around it. Then the same thing is true over here of alcohol and cigarettes. That is, many households have smokers and many households have adults who consume alcohol, but are their children automatically corrupted by those substances, right? If, you know, a kid goes and pilfers dad's liquor or mom's wine or a beer, um, I don't know how corruptible that is, but if it's done on a constant basis where you know, dad comes home and there's no more beer because the kid has consumed it all, then, then yeah, perhaps that's a problem, right? You might want to rethink, you know, keeping it in your house if that's the issue. Um, impairing work and school productivity, you saw Bernadine Healy make that uh, argument. Uh, uh, a moment ago, down here where she says, uh, you know, uh, academic stars are rarely potheads or, um, you know, cannabis junkies hooked for more than 10 years, developed brain injury. Um, so that, that also the language there, right? Like a junkie is someone by definition who's addicted, right? So, uh, someone who has an actual addiction, then, then yeah, that, that's a problem. Um, so uh, you could, you know, say that, yes, perhaps that's true. Uh, some people will counter this and say, well, you know, I'm in the creative industry, you know, I produce art or music or both, uh, and it actually helps me be creative. Uh, that's an argument some people make. Um, one argument against it is that it's a gateway drug. Uh, we saw this earlier in the logical fallacies uh, argument about, you know, don't let your children smoke marijuana because it will lead something to something worse like them using heroin or cocaine. Or you could dial it down a bit and say, <clears throat> don't let your children smoke cigarettes because it'll lead to them trying something worse like cannabis. Um, so yes, perhaps, I mean, that's not a foregone conclusion. Uh, it's a bit of a forced hypothesis, but um, it's not, this, this argument here is not uh, foolproof, you know, it's not solid because Think of how many people have tried alcohol and or cigarettes as adolescents or young adults. And then think of those same people if they are in fact addicted to either one of those. Some people try alcohol and find out they're in fact allergic to it, literally physically allergic to it. So they never use it again. Or some people try alcohol and they're just not feeling it. It's just not for them. It's not a buzz they like, if you will. Or the same thing with cigarettes. You know, they cough and spit and taste terrible. Uh, so it doesn't mean that automatically, if you try a particular drug, that it will therefore lead you to something harder. Um, it's a bit of a fallacy in that. Another reason people say we should not legalize is what I was mentioning earlier, that uh, currently it is illegal in all 50 states in the union according to the federal government, not according to individual state governments, but according to the federal government. And so uh, there are a couple of sources that you can use to discuss this. One is this Kerlikowski uh, statement here. He was, as you can see, uh, the director of the Office of National Drug 
uh, policy under Obama, in fact, right? And he was delivering uh, to the police chiefs here in California uh, a speech. And what I've done for you in this uh, piece is I've sort of marked up uh, his rhetoric, right? Um, for example, the rhetorical spin here of saying, you know, I sit down with people on every side of this issue. And then he said, I've visited 19 states. Well, that's not even 25, which is half of 50. So he hasn't even visited, as I say here, right? Hasn't even visited half of the US, but he's saying he sits down with people on every side of this issue. Uh, okay, not everyone apparently. Um, or um, he'll say, uh, the important truth is that public safety and public health are threatened by drug use. Well, yes. Why even say that, right? Like, you know, avoid stating the obvious. We, we know that drug use is uh, a public safety and public health concern, which is why, in fact, we regulate alcohol and cigarettes for minors in particular. Uh, so you can, you know, go through this piece and uh, see where his rhetorical uh, sources fail. Um, and another piece that you could use is this memo or memorandum uh, from the former attorney general. Remember the attorney general is the highest legal official in the land and it's an appointment made by the president of the United States. So here, former Senator Jeff Beauregard Sessions III, a former senator from Alabama, was appointed attorney general by President Trump, right? Because you can see here, this is a year after Trump takes office. Uh, Trump takes office on January 20th, 2017, and uh, Sessions is his attorney general, at least for a while. And this is a memo to all federal or United States attorneys, right? Who are basically what we we'll call you know, the prosecution, uh, whether at the federal, state, or local level. And the subject is marijuana enforcement. And what this memo back a couple of years ago in 2018 is doing, and it's still largely in effect, uh, the current Attorney General Merrick Garland has not really rescinded this order. Uh, it's basically as this final, because it's only a, it's just a one page memo here. <clears throat> it's basically overturning a previous adjudication or judgment by the uh, former Attorney General, Kevin Cole. Um, and he, Sessions ends here by saying, given the department, meaning Department of Justice, right? You can see the Department of Justice logo up here at the top or seal. Um, he's saying, given the Department of Justice's well-established general principles, previous nationwide guidance, meaning, you know, Cole's, uh, uh, sorry, not Kevin, but uh, sorry, James Cole, um, given his previous guidance specific to marijuana enforcement is unnecessary and is rescinded effective immediately. Uh, to rescind something means in legal terms to uh, take it back, to get rid of it or repeal it. So what Sessions has done here is saying that in a previous memo by James Cole, uh, which is also in your Google Drive folder, if you want to look at that, uh, that we're going to begin actually prosecuting people, right, for federal prosecutions of cannabis. So um, let me give you an example of why this is an issue and, and the sort of difficulty of enforcement or lack thereof. So going back to this, this map here. Um, so all of these states in blue have in their own state made recreational cannabis legal. However, at the national 50 state level, 
it is still considered illegal. So let's say that, you know, Colorado here, the state that actually legalized recreational cannabis first. Uh, I was there in 2007 and eight when it first went up for, uh, what do you call it, uh, for vote and uh, it fell by a, a slim margin. And then in 2012, it passed again. Um, so there's an article here in your Google Drive folder um, about Colorado hitting another milestone with its tax revenue. So this is, okay, remember 2012, they Colorado passed recreational cannabis as legal and then 2013, it takes effect. And then this is a 2017 article. And uh, it's pointing out here that the Colorado Department of Revenue or you know the taxing agency of the state also reported that combined medical and recreational marijuana sales in the month of May, just in May, were 127 million, making this the 12th month in a row in which sales has gone over 100 million. So let me put this in the context for you. Um, at least the last that I was aware, uh, in terms of funding that Grambling receives from the Louisiana State Legislature um, was around, well, when I first got to Grambling in 2008, it was around 30, 31 million. And then it dropped precipitously down to about 11 million. Uh, since the COVID pandemic, uh, more funding for state and uh, higher ed institutions has come in. So the, the amount might be that, but let's say, you know, the current funding were $30 million to Grambling State University. Uh, ULM would receive more, Tech re receive even more than that. Uh, but that's not even coming close to $100 million, which as you can see here in one month, in the month of May in 2017, it reached almost 130 million in taxes. So one of the arguments about why legalizing recreational cannabis should be done as it has for alcohol and cigarettes is that there can be excellent economic taxation or gain from it. That you put the tax money to good use. And in fact, there's a provision in Colorado state um, law when they legalized it, it said that uh, X amount percentage of the taxes had to go to fund education, which you know goes back into schools and teachers and facilities and so on. Um, but my point here is that let's say you know Colorado has all of this money, which you know it it continues to have. Um, then Colorado here has individual vendors, you know, uh, pot sale shops, if you will, uh, whether it's for prescription medical or for actual just personal use. But because it is still considered federally illegal to have, you know, marijuana as a you know, viable, legitimate business, these people cannot put their money these, these store owners, shop owners cannot put their money into a federally insured bank or savings and loan or credit union. Because remember, the federal government, the US government, it regulates banks, savings and loans and credit unions, which is a good thing. Uh, otherwise, our money would be in jeopardy. So uh, the Federal Reserve and the federal government has certain rules about like, you know, you can't engage in illegal activity considered illegal by the government because again, cannabis is still considered a schedule one narcotic by the DEA and by the government. Um, so you can't put your money that you, you know, your 127 million in one month, you can't put that in a bank savings loan and 
or credit union. Therefore, that poses real problems for these business owners and cultivators and distributors and you know all these other people who have jobs around the cannabis industry where it is legal in terms of recreational use. Um, medical use is a little trickier because uh, they can claim that it has some legitimate purpose, you know, to help alleviate glaucoma in a person with uh, eye problems or for chemotherapy for cancer patients and so on. But recreational use is still considered illegal by the federal government. So there's this, you know, butting of heads of federal government versus state rights government. And that's what um, this, uh, these two pieces here, one by uh, Carol Lukowski, who used to be Obama's, uh, what we call drug czar or Office of National Drug Policy. Um, and uh, this uh, memo here by the former Attorney General, Jeff Sessions. Um, let's see. So that's the anti-federal statutes one. Um, some will say that it's too early to know the medical hazards, so we shouldn't do it anyway. Um, well, again, if you're chronically using, then perhaps there's real medical hazards. Um, but if you're eating, say, gummies, right? You're not smoking it. Uh, how detrimental is that to your health if you're doing it once a week or once a month? Well, we don't really know. The, it's true, the, <laughs> um, the jury's out on it, right? And in fact, part of the problem with that is the federal government, up until very, very recently, uh, has um, considered funding for uh, research into medical or other kinds of use of marijuana as uh, illegal, right? Um, <clears throat> so, cook on here. So medical marijuana, right, uh, is not given the kind of funding that other, what do you call it, um, you know, potential drugs for cancer patients or glaucoma or whatever, uh, because it's still considered, you know, again, illegal, right? Um, the NIH and National Institutes of Health estimates, this is uh, the 2000, 2015 piece, so it's a bit dated as well. Uh, spends, where was it? Spends about $30 billion on medical research, right? 30 billion, but there's only a, a tiny fraction of that going to uh, actual medical marijuana use. And the reason again for that is that uh, the federal government does not want to uh, provide uh, what do you call it, um, you know, legitimate research funds, our taxpayer dollars, to something that's still considered a uh, Schedule One narcotic. So just last December here, uh, you can see in this article, there is an actual bill, uh, you know, House bill to promote marijuana research. Um, well, that's not taking me to it. Uh, I want to try to show you how to find this. Uh, so. Um, so all bills, whether they're passed or not passed, uh, can be found on the, as you can see here, congress.gov website. Uh, Congress refers to, in this case, the House of Representatives. Uh, there is another site called the Senate.gov, um, which, of course, refers to the United States Senate, right? And you can, you know, 
in both of these uh, websites, you can search bills, acts, laws that either are under consideration or have already passed. So um, it was introduced in the house, right? And you can find the actual language or text. Uh, and you, this is something you, of course, could quote. This is what you know a bill looks like, right? An act would be a law, right? <clears throat> that is to make marijuana accessible for use by qualified medical or qualified marijuana researchers for medical purposes. So um, the Controlled Substances Act, which again classifies cannabis as a Schedule One narcotic, it would have to be amended or changed, right? to allow cannabis to be used for medical research, right? So here's the act and this is December uh, 2020. The likelihood of this passing is very slim. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, even though Democrats control the House, the Senate and the White House, um, the way that our uh, current situation works in the, especially the Senate, uh, is that conservative senators and House of Representative members don't want to be seen endorsing uh, any kind of law or bill that would seem to give credence or legitimacy to cannabis because they're constituents and people who put them in office are often very conservative. Anyhow, um, so um, yeah, that's kind of referring to this part right here that people say it's a federal crime, so we shouldn't legalize it. Um, yeah, so those are all of the major points uh, of why we should or shouldn't legalize recreational cannabis throughout all 50 states. And your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to write an essay of a minimum of three double space pages that includes properly cited and documented sources following this outline of whether we should or should not legalize recreational cannabis. And so there you go, folks. Uh, that's it for this uh, video lecture. I hope this helps. And uh, take care.